Please welcome Jonathan White. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm from Orcas Island. And as a surfer, sailor, and marine conservationist, I've pretty much spent my life thinking about the tides. Um, in fact, it feels a lot of ways like I've always had a tide chart in my back pocket. And uh, coastal people, in fact, everywhere, whether sailors, divers, surfers, scientists, shellfish growers, or beachcombers, uh, all know that the tide governs what we do, when we go and when we don't go. Because as probably a lot of you know, you only have to buck the tide once to know never to do it again. So about 20 years ago, I, uh, I decided it was time to learn how the tides work. I had a small accident with my boat with the tides, and I figured it was time to learn. And uh, I knew the moon had something to do with it, but not what exactly. I figured I'd spend a couple of weeks, read a few books, and learn pretty much everything there was to know about the tide. But I was wrong. The more I studied, the more interesting, the more fascinating, the more complex and poetic it became. And pretty soon, my few weeks of research turned into 10 years, and many, many papers and books. And my fascination for the tide took me all over the globe to study the fastest, largest, and scariest tides in the world. So I wanted to just share with you just a few of the facts, the really amazing facts that I encountered. So this, of course, is Galileo. And he wondered about the tides. In the 16, early 1600s, it was believed that the Earth stood still and, it was, and was at the center of the universe, as all of you know. Well, Galileo and a few of his friends believed differently, and they tried to prove it at the grave risk of heresy. When Galileo was on a boat in Italy on a gondola carrying jugs of water, he had an aha moment. He saw that the water in the jugs were sloshing back and forth with the movement of the boat in the waves. And so he thought, well, if the, if the jugs of water were sloshing, and if those were the tides, and the boat was the earth, or, then it would, be, it, it would follow that the tides were evidence that the earth moved, the earth or the boat moved. So he used that as evidence of a whole cosmic world that was different than anything else that had been proposed before. Galileo's book, The Flux and Reflux of the Sea, was about the tide. But a friendly pope convinced him to change the title because the title was so contentious. Yet, it didn't work. When that book came out, it was dripping with heresy. And within two weeks, it was banned. And the author was summoned before the Holy Inquisition and sentenced to a life imprisoned in his home. He was just recently uh, uh, exonerated from that. The tide is a lot of things, but fundamentally, it's a wave. It's a long, low wave that travels around the world at the speed of a modern jet, 450 miles per hour. We don't experience it as a fast-moving phenomenon because it's such a long, low wave. But if we went out on the beach and stood there long enough, we would see that wave pass. We would see first the, the low tide, which is the, the trough of that wave. And then about six hours later, we would see the crest of that wave, high tide. And then about six hours later, we would see the trough again, low tide. So about 12 hours from crest to crest, or trough to trough as that wave passes. The tides also create friction, a lot of it by rubbing against the ocean floor. Some of that is dissipated as heat, lots, a lot like when we rub our, our hands together. But most of it is transferred into energy that acts, that acts as a break on the Earth's rotation. So by a very small amount every day, 
the earth is turning slower and our days are getting longer because of the tide. 400 million years ago, our days were 22 hours long, not 24. And that same energy is pushing the moon away at the rate of about 10 feet in a human lifetime. So the moon that causes the tide is being pushed away by the tide. This is a tidal bore, which is when the tide comes up the river in the form of a wave or a solid wall of water. This one is on the Chentong River in China, just south of Shanghai. And what you're looking at here is this is, we're about 50 miles from the ocean. And this is low tide in the river. And this is the tidal bore moving from left to right at about 15 miles per hour. And these are people right here on the jetty watching. There are about 100 tidal bores around the world. But the one on the Chentong is the largest. It gets up to 25 feet tall. And it comes in on every tide, twice a day, and has done that for 2,500 years. In fact, the first tide chart came out of here to predict the arrival of the boar. That was in 1000 AD. It was etched in stone and 200 years before, before the first tide chart appeared in the West for the London Bridge. This is it in full bloom, and it gets up to 25 feet when it's coincident with a large storm in the East China Sea. And when it does that, sometimes two or three times a year, it typically jumps the jetty and, and floods acres of valuable farmland. And every year, people drown. One of the, the, the fifth century poets said, this is the strangest and most wonderful thing under heaven. The largest tides in the world are found in the Bay of Fundy and Ungava Bay. Those are both on the east coast of Canada. One is directly above Maine, the Bay of Fundy, and the Ungava Bay is about 1,300 miles north of there, just under the Arctic Circle. And these two places have records tides of 54 feet, 6 inches, which is not just high. It's higher by 10 feet than the next largest tides in the world. There's so much water that moves in and out of the Bay of Fundy, for example, that it's equal to, in any 12-hour average tide period, it's equal to four times the outflow of all the world's rivers. All the world's rivers in 12 hours' time flows in and out of the Bay of Fundy. And then up north, where I got a chance to visit, the ocean freezes, of course, and that frozen surface of the ocean and the tides allow a very unique access to food. In the Arctic, and I think this is the only place this happens in the world, in Kangasuiak, during just the right tide and just the right ice conditions in winter, the, Luke, the, the uh, Inuit elder people dig a hole about three foot thick in the winter ice and shimmy down below when the tide is out into the hollow, dark, warm regions below the ice to hunt for fresh blue mussels. This is an elder named Lucas Inopoluk who I spent a week with up there. You can't see that very well, but he's underneath the ice there. It's a very eerie thing, very womb-like, very, very funny. I, I mean, not funny. It was, it was, um, it felt like I had not just gone under the surface of the ocean, but it felt like I had gone inside the body of the ocean. The tides are also energy. A recent UK report said that if 0.1 percent, one tenth of one percent of the available energy in the ocean could be, uh, could be translated into electricity, it would supply the Earth's need five times over. One-tenth of one percent of the energy available in the ocean. If we could capture that, it would solve, I mean not solve, but it would supply all, the need, all of our needs five times over on the whole planet.
or we live on a on a planet that's se that's 75% ocean. From cities like New York to LA to Sao Paulo, Hong Kong, London, and so on and so forth, and numerous small communities and towns live along the coast. 50% or more of our population live on the coast. This is where our ancestors first settled. It was where we could get food in the intertidal zone. So on a blue planet, there's no way around it. There's nobody that is very far from the sea and its tides. We are really coastal people. Thank you.